All right, so the first question was, well, what does it mean to have a belief system? And that's a very complicated problem. And I think it's, it's a subset of the question of being. Maybe you can break the question of being into two domains, which we've done in this class, and you could say, well, you can assess being from the perspective of what exists, and then you can assess being from the perspective of how you ought to act. So it's like you walk into a room and you can describe the furniture, or you can determine how you're going to conduct yourself in the room. Maybe it's the difference between a play and the stage setting for a play. Now, the modernist perspective, roughly speaking, is that the fundamental reality is to be found in the description of the furniture, so to speak, in the description of what is. That's the scientific process. And the scientific process seems to involve the stripping off of the subjective from perception and to some degree from action, and the extraction of the commonalities across perception as a means of delineating the nature of reality. Now, obviously that's a very powerful process, and it has many advantages, but exactly what it is that science is doing is not precisely clear. One perspective might be is that we are genuinely um, discovering the nature of objective reality, and perhaps even the nature of reality itself, but there are some problems with that perspective. One of them being that the scientific process seems to strip the subjective from the phenomenon. It does that technically, right? I mean, you have a hypothesis about what something is, and you have a hypothesis about what something is, and you have a hypothesis about some, what something is, and we undertake a number of procedures to assess what the fundamental phenomena is, and then we look across our perceptual sets, and we extract out the commonalities, and we dispense with everything that is superfluous, everything that's merely subjective. So what you feel about the chair is not relevant to the objective existence of the chair. You're, and so it il eradicates subjectivity. And that's a very useful process, because it does seem to enable us to grasp reality in a fundamental sense more profoundly, but it leaves the subjective behind, and maybe that's a problem. Be well, is, is something irretrievably lost if you dispense with the subjective? And, and also, how deep a hole do you dig when you dispense with the subjective? And I think that that's inter intrinsically associated with the problem of the relationship between is and ought, because that's an old philosophical conundrum, I think first put forth by Dave, David Hume, who made the claim that no matter how much you know about something from an empirical perspective, you cannot use that as an unerring guide to action in relationship to that, to that empirical object or set of empirical objects. And people, it's a tricky issue, you know, because obviously you can use empirical information to inform your decisions. But I think but the problem is, is that there's multiple pathways of action that are implied by any set of data. That seems to be the fundamental problem. It's something like that, is that you can't draw a one-to-one -one specification be between the empirical description and what sh you should do about that. And like maybe an example is, well, you can gather a lot of information about AIDS, and you can gather a lot of information about cancer, and you can gather a lot of information about educational outcomes and economic outcomes and so forth. But it isn't obvious how you then use that empirical information, uh, for example, how to guide policy decisions, because you might say, well, how much money should we spend on education compared to cancer prevention, and how much money should we spend on cancer prevention compared to curing AIDS, and, or, or addressing disease in a third world country. And what happens is that the set of variables that you encounter while trying to make your empirical calculation get to be so massive, so rapidly, that there doesn't seem to be any logical way of linking them to a behavioral outcome. That's kind of associated with the postmodern conundrum as well, which is, well, if you have a set of data, and it, it could be a literary work for that matter, there's a very large number of interpretations that you can derive from that set of data, and there's no simple way of deciding which one is going to be canonical. And so it isn't 
it, I, I think the reason that you can't derive an ought from an is is because you run into something like combinatorial explosion. It's like you have an infinite number of facts at your disposal, roughly speaking, and then another infinite number of ways that you can organize those facts, and that massive array of facts and 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 recategorized facts doesn't tell you what to do in a given situation. And so maybe the question of what to do in a given situation is a different domain of question. And I, I believe that to be the case. I think it was Stephen Jay Gould who talked about religion and science as two, I think he called them different magisterium, two different fundamental domains that, and that each had their realm of operation. And one was the description of the objective world, obviously that's on the scientific end, and the other was the realm of ethics, and so you could put religion, mythology, narrative, the humanities, all of that, history even for that matter to some degree into the, into the ethics category. And because I don't see a, a straightforward way of taking a set of facts and then transforming them into a behavioral compulsion, then I do think that these two things are reasonably regarded as overlapping and in intrinsically associated, but, but technically and philosophically separable. All right, so then, then the next question emerges, well, if they're separable, if there has to be a domain of inquiry into the structure of values, what might that look like? Like, how is it that you would understand the psychological and sociological phenomena that are associated with a moral stance? How, how, and how would you understand the details of that? And then, even more to the point, is there any way of subjecting different sets of ethical interpretation to testing so that you can judge their comparative validity because that's sort of the way out of moral relativism roughly speaking it's like first you make the proposition that there are value structures and that they're independent from empirical investigation and then the next is that you investigate the possibility that you can compare and contrast different structures of ethics and draw some sort of conclusion that's not merely arbitrary now it might be turtles all the way down that's how the old joke goes right but but maybe not, and I was interested in that again, because I thought, well, are we fighting the Cold War merely because we're having an argument, or is there some manner in which one of these systems can be just determined to be wrong? And of course, there was more weight behind that query, because the Soviet system and the Maoist system and and the system that's in place in North Korea were not only predicated on different assumptions than the Western system, but they were also extraordinarily murderous. And so that seemed to add additional weight to the, to the sequence of questions. So, I was reading Jung at the time, and Jung was, Carl Jung was fi fundamentally, I would say, a psychologist of narrative of story and and he outlined this he outlined the idea for me that people inhabited stories roughly speaking he said actually they inhabited myths and even more to the point whether they knew it or not they inhabited archetypal myths or even that they were possessed by them and so it was the first time i'd really come into contact with the idea directly put that there was a direct relationship between the structures that you use to orient yourself in the world and stories and so then I started to assess the fundamental elements of stories what, what might a story look like and while I was doing that, that was informed by a number of other things that I was reading about including a set of I, I, I read the neuroscience literature with regards to information processing fairly extensively and that introduced me to a whole set of other ideas, including cybernetic ideas, which have been incorporated into what I was describing to you. And this basic cybernetic system is a system that has a starting point and a system that has an end point, and a system that has a subsystem that monitors progress or deviation from progress 
along the pathway to the endpoint. And I thought, well, that looks a lot like a story. Or a map, that's another way of thinking about it. And I thought, okay, well, that's where the overlap is. And the fundamental story is something like, it's, it's very straightforward. It's, and it's also the frame that you inhabit when you conceptualize the world and, and, narrow and, and s narrow and simplify the world, which you have to do because it's so complex, because you have this infinite number of facts that are laying around you. Well, so what are you doing? Well, you're a mobile creature, a living creature, not a static information processor. And you're targeted, you're a targeted creature. And otherwise you wouldn't move, right? To move is to be a targeted creature because you have to move towards something or away from something. So the targeting is built right into the fact that you're a mobile creature. And then you might say, well, what do you target? And the answer to that is, well, you target, you target, you could say you target what you aim for. But then you could say, well, you, you aim for what you want. You target your desires. And then that leads you into a discussion of the underlying neurobiology, essentially. You bring to the table a set of inbuilt desires. And the targets that you pick have to address the fact that those desires exist.